you might find very interesting opportunities with these stately homes, depending on their geographical location. Those that are located, let's say, up to an hour from a big city might do very well as sources of income, as as business opportunities. Welcome to Global Real Estate Insider, a podcast where we share tips and strategies to help international home buyers and investors. Whether you're looking for a new home abroad or an agent eager to expand your reach, this podcast is the ultimate guide to navigating global real estate markets. Here's your host, Nick Marr. Welcome to the Global Real Estate Insider and our podcast. Great to have you here, Bogna Gladden Obadinska. Have I said that correctly? Absolutely, Excellent. yes. Thank you. Glad to be here. Right. You're actually our first real estate agent that's going to be on the show. So, And I particularly look forward to having a chat with you because we have spoken in the past and you revealed some real hidden gems about Poland. And so I'm hoping that um, people that are listening to us right now are, are going to be as amazed as I was about the market and your actual experience. Um, what's the agency that you work for? Um, it's a small agency um, called Castellan Estate. Um, it's a yeah. boutique agency, you can say. I run it with my partner. I own the company. Uh, we sometimes mm. employ agents if we need to, but basically we work together and just collaborate with experts in various fields of real estate, surveyors, okay. um, appraisers, lawyers, notaries, et cetera, et cetera. Right. A bit about me. I, I've been running homesgofast.com uh, since 2002 and another platform, which is high-end property, europeanproperty.com, since 1999. So I've obviously lot of, met a lot of people in that time. And I love connecting people, you know, across the world with real estate and, you know, realizing their dreams. What about you? What drives you? How come you're an estate agent or a real estate agent in Poland? <laughs> well, it was a long journey. <laughs> I my my first career is in uh, philosophical aesthetics and um, art history. I have been lecturing for a long time about uh, for a long time at universities about about the perception, about the aesthetic experience, also the environmental experience and, and ways in which we interact with where we live, with what we do from the perspective of well-being and, uh, and connecting both with other people in these spaces and with the spaces themselves. Therefore, um, the, the interest was there always. And also part of that interest was in heritage and how we preserve our heritage, what makes our heritage both tangible and intangible. And therefore, uh, real estate um, just integrated both of these fields. And when I decided to try living more active life than contemplative life and stepped out onto the realm of business while doing research still, because I, I'm partly involved with research as well, but that the real estate was such a natural field to do that, that, that it just, it just happened. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, it sounds very interesting and especially around the sort of the historic side of things. I mean, a, a few, can you give our listeners, um, you know, a little bit of a history lesson around Polish real estate? Actually, the name of my of my company, Castellan, uh, it okay. may seem um, connected to the Spanish language, but it's not. It actually comes from Latin Castellan, Castellan in Polish, who was the okay. first uh, office of the real estate agent for the king. We had that office, a person who looked after all the properties of the king in the in the old times from 15th century onwards here in Poland, and mm-hmm. and that figure. Um, was responsible for acquisition, sales, uh, and also management of properties. So that gives you the scope of, of time when where this uh, role sort of reaches back. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that 
period of Poland from 15th century onwards was actually the the best for Poland. We we were a, a big rich country where a lot of estates were built, where a lot of cities were created and developed. And then, of course, the the turbulences of of the partition of Poland, where we just disappeared from the maps for over a hundred years, was a gap. And then the 20th century, we know, was a, a very tragic moment for our history, also including uh, the infrastructure, both residential, mm-hmm. factories, all kinds of infrastructure. So, in fact, it would have been after the Second World War when we started rebuilding those infrastructures, but it wasn't because communism also froze that moment for a while. And it's been the latest, the last 20 years when Poland's real estate really took off. So it's still on the rise and in all fields of real estate, of the market, there are still lots of opportunities for investors. There was something that when we spoke last, you spoke about stately homes and sort of very grand properties. Mm. Tell me a little bit about those, the um, Polish real estate sector. This also is related very closely to the structure of the society because until the 20th century, basically, we were a monarchy and a monarchy that uh, was based on small estates. Um, Well, I said societal structure, but also economical structure because those estates were actually, uh, I could compare them to modern day big companies or corporations even because each of Mm -hmm. those estates employed lots of people each of those estates had a little factory or manufacture of some or food uh, processing manufacturing or or timber or other things they had they had resources that they cultivated so they were basically usually a similar size between a hundred hectares some of them were much bigger some of them were smaller so, in fact, all of the terrain of Poland can be defined um, on the maps with those estates. It's like, it was a division, the administrative division, we can say, mm-hmm. that, that originated in the 15th century and lasted through uh, the 19th century. If you travel through Poland, you can see the remnants of them whenever you see a park in the middle of fields. And that park, you can be absolutely sure, contains a beautiful estate, stately home, bigger or smaller, sometimes a palace, sometimes just a, just a home. Uh, okay. And they are all usually very beautiful and usually in a very poorly state. They, they, they need a lot of care and, and uh, TLC <laughs> to bring them yeah. back to their original um, uh, and, and usefulness. Because during the communist times, they were somewhat neglected. The state had taken them over from the original owners and they didn't care for them the way such mm-hmm. homes should have been cared for. With the, the sort of former stately homes then, is that an opportunity really for foreign foreign buyers or not? Is Is that something that people could look at? I think so. It depends on um, on your goals. If your goal is mainly income, generating income, you might find very interesting opportunities with these stately homes, depending on their geographical location. Mm. Those that are located, let's say, up to an hour from a big city might do very well as sources of income as as business opportunities because lots of companies would be hiring them for their conferences events uh, trainings uh, retreats etc etc and such a distance is probably a perfect one because you can keep people in one place for a while to, to work together without them going back into the city but they are not too far away also those that are located in uh, resorts areas at the seaside in the mm-hmm. mountains in some picturesque landscapes especially in the southwest of poland um mm-hmm. yeah those might be bigger sometimes they are castles sometimes they are big palaces and those i think uh, really offer great opportunity because you can turn them into a 
four-star hotels with uh, with hundreds of rooms, with um, swimming pools, gyms, spas, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all kind of infrastructure that might benefit the users. But those that are yeah. smaller and more remote uh, are more suited, I would say, for private residences. If if you'd like to yeah. have a beautiful home to raise your children, surrounded by history and surrounded by by the local uh, culture, then I would recommend those. Do you have sort of listed building status? You know, like talking from a UK perspective, there are certain things that you're not allowed to do with historical buildings. Um, you have to get permission to maybe, a, you know, to change the internal structure of the building or the windows, those type of things. So we have these listed buildings. Is that the same in Poland? So um, we do have uh, listed buildings. We don't have categories like those you have in the, in the UK with A, B, and C yeah. um, category of listed building. We have two types of uh, listed buildings, ones that are listed by the local um, authorities, uh, let's say a county, mm -hmm. and those that are listed in national registries. And in fact, the, um, the status of a listed building that's protected by the conservation officer only re regards those that are listed in the national registry. And those, yes, you right. need to ask for permission uh, about the materials you need to use, about the type of um, techniques you need to use for the restoration, etc., etc. So that's pretty similar. But not all of those historic buildings are listed. In fact, uh, only only some of them. What is the current property market like in Poland, from your perspective? It's dynamic. <laughs> it's very dynamic. Okay. I have been observing it closely for the last eight years, and there have been big changes. We were on a very steep rise with with prices for real estate uh, until the twenty two when the war started behind our eastern uh, border and that affected all of Europe with uh, prices for uh, for energy, for materials, uh, etc., etc. And that caused the interest rates to uh, raise in Poland, which has reversed the market at the moment. So we had the seller's market for a long time. Now we have the buyer's market mm -hmm. uh, there are still lots of properties on the market. People do list them, but yeah. there is much less demand. Therefore, you can really pick and choose. <laughs> okay, so we've got a buyer's market right to at today's date in uh, October 2024. Okay, interesting. Right. But what areas would you recommend uh, foreign buyers to go to or, or you know f from a foreign buyer's perspective looking at Poland how would you approach the market if you were a foreign buyer again I would say it very much depends on your goal uh, whether you're looking for residential properties or for business investment or you're a company who'd like to move their uh, their base to Poland uh, I think this kind of market, the commercial market, poses lots and lots of opportunities because um, land is still much cheaper than in Western Europe. Um, a lot of it still is agricultural, but de designed for uh, for development, for uh, turning into commercialable land. And you can negotiate zoning permissions. At the moment, we have a new law since last year uh, that allows investors to collaborate with the local government towards the redevelopment of land. We also have a special law that allows, a re, we call it, a revitalizing of, of post-industrial lands. That is done especially in the south in our mining region where a lot of old mines were shut down and now all those terrains um, are ready for redevelopment for very interesting projects from residential um, housing uh, buildings and estates to, to industrial uses, to parks and, and recreation areas as well, sports centers, etc., etc. There's really a lot to choose from. 
Uh, and then, of course, the cities. Um, I didn't talk about listed buildings within cities in our old towns, but there are lots of opportunities there as well. They are usually tenement buildings with um, apartments to lease. And what is a novelty on the Polish market is PRSs. So more and more companies are uh, entering this um, this sector of the real estate here. Um, to start leasing w within the institutional lease format. And this is something that I think may be the biggest opportunity right now because some few Poles can afford to get a, a loan and a mortgage mm -hmm. loan to buy themselves a property. It, it also concerns uh, apartments. So lots of people are interested in, in renting properties. So what types of properties are most in demand at the moment, just generally uh, in your region? So I will give you a uh, concrete answer to this general question by just choosing one segment okay. of, the, of the market. Yeah. So because of the changes, because people can't afford to buy apartments, houses uh, and, and residences for themselves, as I mentioned, the rental market is very hot at the moment. So investors who might want to build a an apartment building to let to uh, private users, that could be a very good opportunity. And I think also um, there is still a great hunger for houses in Poland because we were forced for the last... 70 years to live in blocks of apartments, apartment buildings that were still that were substandard when it comes to the um, to the square footage of of each apartment. That was the you know the the, the poor communist way of of um, providing living spaces, and we are still trying to get out of that as a society. And the hunger for living in a house on the outskirts of a big city with your own piece of garden where your kids can play with your dog and then even commuting is 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 fine with us but, but that dream is still there so there are a lot of developers who just specialize in that kind of building and um, that can't be too big but it's bigger than apartments and they can be affordable for an average uh, average uh, consumer in Poland and I think that's an interesting segment of the market to consider what is the, the sort of the general process uh, with buying and selling in Poland who pays fees do the buyers pay the estate agent a fee or how does it all work well until 2014 the agencies had to be registered and licensed until the, uh, after 2014 this uh, segment has been deregularized so now there are many different formats of how agencies work and mm -hmm. there are agencies that charge both parties of the transaction they have a commission from the seller and they also charge a fee to the buyer i represent a group of over 4000 agents uh, around poland um, we have an association we, in which we promote the what we call representational format or, or, or method of working, which basically means that we only represent one side of each transaction. So if I'm representing the seller, the seller pays my commission and I can show each property either to private people who just come to for the viewings or agents with their clients. So I collaborate with other agents in, in this kind of format of, of work. Uh, and then there are those uh, agencies, but there are very few of them who only charge the buyer uh, for their costs, uh, for their fees. I don't collaborate a lot with them, but, uh, but that's how it works. When it comes to the costs of a transaction, if you're a buyer, you will be paying the cost of the notary you will be paying a tax if you're a private person buying a residential home you will be pay paying a two percent tax that the state takes for the procedure and a few other small costs but that's the main cost uh, the seller usually doesn't pay anything 
on the cost of transaction. If you're a company, you will pay the VAT instead of the 2% uh, yeah. tax. Is, is there a, any particular trend at the moment with uh, people from a certain region that like to buy, um, overseas buyers maybe? Have you know, you know, is there a particular nationality that's attracted to Poland, for example? Well, um, yes. Uh, one more thing in response to your previous question. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. All, all EU citizens can buy can buy any kind of property in Poland. Okay, that's interesting. Foreigners yeah. who are from outside of the EU can only buy the an apartment, basically without any per- permissions. If you want to buy land, which means like a house built on a land, um, then you need a permission from the uh, from the ministry that's responsible for that. And that lasts about a year to, to get, a year or 18 months. So if you're from outside of the EU, you need to take that into account that it may, uh, it may last a little. You have to prepare your process. Responding to your second question, after 2020, when the war started in Ukraine, the Ukrainians have become our biggest investor in Poland because okay. a lot of uh, Ukrainians came to Poland uh, seeking shelter. And at first they were mostly renting, but then a lot of them decided to start their businesses or they, they sought work and they stayed in Poland and they really invest into purchases of, of uh, residential Mm, properties mostly, but not only. They also have moved a lot of their business um, here. So um, also commercial um, investments are popular among the Ukrainians. But then there are also a lot of Middle Eastern investors in Poland, especially in resorts, in the mountains, for example. There are towns that are famously popular among um, Middle Eastern investors. There was a period when a lot of Russian investors came to Poland. Uh, that's less uh, so nowadays. And obviously, um, our neighbors uh, from Czech Republic, from Germany. Another new sector of the real estate, a, uh, real estate market here in Poland that wasn't so popular before is senior housing. And that's apartment buildings with facilities for care it's it's a whole range from full day and night care homes to just daycare homes to to independent apartments where seniors might just prefer to live because there would be a doctor on the premises etc so that's an interesting market too yeah and that sort of retirement uh, village or a retirement accommodation is de- definitely going to be on the growth as uh, we it get will. The aging populations yeah. Uh, very interesting. So is there any particular areas in Poland that are attractive that or emerging or, you know, um, that maybe someone should consider looking at if they're researching Poland? Yes, I would say so. There are obviously the big cities that most investors foreign investors uh, have heard about that others have been investing heavily in it, which is the capital Warsaw, then the biggest port in Gdańsk uh, in the north at the Baltic Sea, and then Krakow. Krakow is mostly interesting for tourist um, investments, for tourist apartments. But then I would encourage uh, investors to look at smaller cities and cities more to the west and those even more to the east although with the war going on behind uh, our eastern border those have become a little less interesting to investors but the ones in the west especially Poznań, Wrocław, Szczecin, um, Łódź. Łódź is a city that's about an hour away from from Warsaw the capital it's very well connected by highways and trains and, and, and there are lots of people who commute from Woods to also. And the prices there have been on a very steep rise for the last two years and I'm sure they will be still because they are still more or less half of the prices you can get in Warsaw and, and, and the city is becoming more and more popular. So you can really make a killing if you invest in Woods now. 
Um, oh, and then there are those much smaller towns that are under 100,000 that we call them like a little ring around big cities where people also are relocating because real estate is cheaper than in the big cities, but they are close enough to commute to the big city. Therefore, those yeah. may also have um, good returns on, on investment. What are your sort of tips about the market? How should someone approach it? Uh, you know, get, is there some general advice that you know, the listeners here thinking, do you know what, I might uh, invest in Poland? What What's your sort of uh, your top tips? I think well, Poland is super interesting to Western investors because Poland is one of the safest places in Europe. When it comes to safety in cities, we don't have, for example, a phenomenon well known here in the US where, uh, sorry, I'm saying here in the US, I, I happen to be here at the moment, but um, we don't have bad districts, for example. We don't have dangerous areas. Obviously, mm-hmm. after dark, anyone can become a, a victim of pickpocketing or something like that, but it's really rare in Poland. And, and it's a very nice place to live, simply. The cities have grown immensely over the last 30 years. So you will find lots of very new infrastructure from the subway, through the roads, through just the redecoration of of interiors. You will find that Mm -hmm. our hotels are very new. Um, It's a very convenient place to live in Poland, actually, at the moment. And um, and all those things I think make it interesting for people just to just to live and and to run their families. You know, you you, you have schools, you have you have shops, you have shopping centers, etc. Everything is at a walking distance in many of the cities. Yeah, mm. we, it's very green um, and climate is very agreeable. We have. Somewhat severe winters by comparison to, for example, Italy, but then our summers aren't that severe. They're, it's still hot. We get three months of 30 degrees every summer, but it's not 40. So I would say those are all very good conditions for you to consider investing in Poland. If I was to give you a warning, just to be a bit more objective and not just advertise my country, <laughs> yeah. um, okay. you, may, you may be careful with flips because a lot of apartments have been redecorated, and I'm saying redecorated on purpose as opposed to uh, refurbished or renovated thoroughly. Um, Mm -hmm. by people who do this as a business. And some of them do it very thoroughly and they they, they truly renovate, including all the uh, plumbing and and electricity infrastructure and so on. Others just barely redecorate and sell it on. And you need to be careful to have somebody who is an expert to check that for you, the technical um, conditions, if you're buying on the secondary market. If you're buying from developers... Mm -hmm. You need to also check for quality. There are a lot of laws that protect the buyer and, and and some developers are more interested in quality. Some are more interested in in quantity of their sales. So you need to yeah. be careful checking for the quality as well. But I think otherwise it's a pretty straightforward market and, and, and there aren't many traps when it comes okay. to, and what, to buying. Uh, and generally, um, what about language barriers? Do most people speak English, Polish, or what, how, how does it work? What's the feel? I think that English is becoming more and more known and used in Poland. Obviously, it's our second language. We, we learn at school. And the, the younger generations are more at ease using it. They have traveled more. They have, they have learned it from, from watching um, television in English. The older generations may struggle a little because during communist times, there weren't many opportunities to learn foreign languages. But I think that nowadays, those generations have mostly retired. So you may find a lot of people being able to communicate in English better or 
or, or, or maybe less um, with, with less easiness, but but that would be possible. All right. Is there anything else that you should mention to people that are listening to this show now uh, with interest, with your expertise? Is there anything else that we should know? I will tell you one thing that maybe um, I, th- I find this interesting from the um, theoretical point of view. In Poland, yeah. real estate is defined by law as a surface of land. So if you are buying a property in Poland, what you are actually buying is a piece of land or shares mm-hmm. in a piece of land in the case of an apartment that, that has shares in a piece of land that's under the apartment building. Mm-hmm. And we don't have problems like those in England, for example, with a property that that isn't really fully owned by the by the owner. Yeah, so because of the yeah the difference yeah. between sort of freehold and leasehold. Exactly. Yeah, uh, leasehold. UK at least we don't have yeah. that. If you're buying your property, you really are buying uh, the. The freehold and 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 you really are investing in in a property and and then it's yours and that's something that also defines us poles after so many mm-hmm. years of communism where when nobody really owned anything that we really like mm-hmm. to own <laughs> land and we like yeah. to own property to, to to feel that we truly belong and if you do that he, in Poland I think I think that's um, it's going to affect you because because we have this mindset about about really being landowners to some degree, bigger or smaller the land, but we like mm-hmm. to own land. <laughs> okay, from the the conversation, I still feel that the the listed buildings, the sort of like the big manor homes in Poland, sound really exciting because I can imagine they're historic and grand buildings. I wonder where they're located in Poland. Is is that something you you would help people with? Very gladly. I am located in Warsaw, so I mostly work around Mazovia, which is a big region in the centre of Poland, mostly lowlands. And that uh, region, that district of Poland, is covered by a network of these stately homes. A lot of them are for sale. They usually Mm. come with between three and ten hectares of land, usually it would be a park. And our parks around those stately homes are not in the French style. They are all in the British style, the English style of the, you know, 1800s and 1700s developed by the the sentimental style of of setting them. So they are very natural. They have beautiful canopy of, of big trees. Often oaks, uh, and so so they they would be everywhere basically. Every five kilometers, you can find one. What sort of money are we speaking here? What would someone pay for a historic building? It depends on its state. If it has already been renovated by someone who knew what they were doing and they did it thoroughly, it would be probably around, uh, depending on the size of the property, but the cheapest ones might cost maybe £2 million. The bigger ones may cost, with more may, with more land and those that have been especially turned into, into commercial, yes, infrastructures, maybe hotels, conference centres, etc., or sports centers, yeah. those may be more expensive, four million, uh, five million pounds. Okay. Those that are in a very poorly state and need a lot of investment to to renovate them, they may be very cheap. They may be several hundred thousand pounds. Maybe okay. the cheapest ones I have seen sold maybe even down to a hundred thousand pounds. Wow. And obviously, probably needs a lot of work to do to do it to make it in. Yeah, you habitable. need a million. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> you might need a million and, and also, pounds to to then make yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. And I'd imagine quite expensive to maintain um, once you've got there. But very interesting 
niche around the stately homes and listed buildings and all comes with land and it's historic i think it's a pretty attractive proposition um especially as it sounds like it's uh, fairly low cost just from my point of view it sounds re- really interesting I'd lo- it's almost like i'd love to see some pictures of them um some of these places but no okay a really interesting exploring poland's real estate market with you bogner we're going to wind up now i think we've spoken for a few moments that's good yeah 40 nearly 40 minutes um and it's been good so you've been listening to the global real estate insider with bogna gladden obudinska who is from castilian estate in poland and uh really appreciate you coming to the show uh and sharing your expertise with us and i'm sure we'll speak again Um, Thank you. I'm looking forward to hearing more of your podcasts. Thanks for tuning in to the Global Real Estate Investor Podcast. If you're a buyer or investor, be sure to visit our platforms, homesgofast.com and europeanproperty.com. You'll find thousands of properties for sale and investment opportunities listed by agents, developers, and private owners. Whether you're looking for a second home, a luxury estate, or a profitable investment, we have something for you on our platforms. Don't miss out. Check out homesgofast.com and europeanproperty.com today. And remember, stay tuned for more insights and expert advice on global real estate.